Have you ever noticed that John's gospel intro sounds a lot like Genesis chapter one? There's a reason for this and it's all about Jesus. Let's just say John wants us to see Jesus in Genesis one at the creation. There's so much spiritual gold in this passage. And when you see what John is doing on the first page of his gospel, you'll never read the Bible the same. You'll never be the same. So let's jump into the scriptures to unpack these hidden truths about Christ as it relates to Genesis chapter one. So here we are in John chapter one, verse one. It says, in the beginning, was the word. Now in Genesis chapter one, it actually says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in the beginning, nothing's happening. Just something is, something is existing and it's called the word. And I'm going to highlight the word in blue. Okay. And any attribute about the word in yellow, the word is in the beginning. The word just is, is existing. And the word is with God. Meaning, and this is what we'll see in John chapter 8 when Jesus actually says, before Abraham was, I am. But the word was actually with God in the beginning. In the beginning of what? Well, if we go to Genesis chapter 1, the beginning actually refers to the heavens and the earth coming into creation. The word was God. So now we have a third thing about this word. And if you've been in church for any amount of time, you probably know that the word is Jesus, another title, another way of communicating the, the greatness and the uniqueness of Jesus being the word, right? And what you need to know about the word is in Genesis chapter one, we actually see God speaking the world into existence, the heavens and the earth. Well, the spoken word that comes and proceeds from God to bring creation into existence, you're supposed to see that as Jesus. In Genesis chapter one, what words are from the mouth or to the mouth is what Jesus is to the father. He proceeds from the father. He's the eternal living word that emanates from the father. You're supposed to see Jesus in the beginning with the father. He's with God. And at the same time, he is God. He was in the beginning. Notice the over and over past tense verbiage used of this word. How it's not like he comes into existence or he's created. He just always has been. He was in the beginning with God. In case you missed it in the first verse, John wants you to know in no uncertain terms, Jesus pre-exists creation with the Father to be the means by which creation comes into existence. All things were made through him. What things? <laughs> because it, all things were made through this word. Just like you see in Genesis chapter one, God speaking. God said, let there be. Well, Jesus becomes or is to be seen as the method by which creation comes into existence. It's through him. He's the instrument. He's the vessel, you might say, that creation is effectualized. When God says, it seems like this word manifests or accomplishes and all things were made through him now this literally means all things not most things not colossians 1 will tell us all things in heaven on the earth under the earth everything that exists as created apart from god because god is uncreated everything comes through the son who is the word that proceeds from the father and without him was not anything made that was made in other words, watch, everything that is made only exists not just through Jesus, but by Jesus. In other words, think of everything that possibly exists in every dimension of reality that you're aware of, <laughs> the heavenly realms, the spiritual realm, everything that is made by God, which excludes God himself. God is the only uncreated one the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover. He is the eternally existent one that precedes all created things. Everything besides God is created or made. And John wants you to know everything that's made exists through the Son or through the Word, which means the Word is in a category of that which is uncreated, not that which is made, but that which is uncreated and precedes all things that are created. So through him, all things are made or come into existence. But also, 
nothing is made without him. So there is nothing in existence that is made without the word of God. The father and son's partnership in John's gospel is incredibly important to John's point of his whole writing. When he recounts all that Jesus does at the end of the gospel, he goes, I write these things to you so that you may believe. He wants you to know the father and the son's partnership that exists in eternity past. And it precedes creation. It pre-exists time, space, and matter. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. So in Genesis, you see things coming into existence. God says, let there be light. And what John wants you to see is that the physical light that is brought forth in Genesis 1 is actually a shadow or a type of the true spiritual light that comes through the sun. So watch, it says, in him, in who? In the word was life. And you go, cool. Well, hold on. Life being being, breath, essence, the animating life force of God, okay? The life is actually in Jesus, the word. And the life was the light of men. What shines into the darkness of humanity is the life of Jesus, the word. In other words, the word brings the life that is the light to our darkness, Darkness is often uh, representative of death, whereas light represents life. And so you're supposed to think back in Genesis chapter 1 when God says, let there be light. What the light ends up being to the sun, because light is created first, then the sun. What the light is to the sun, as it emanates from the sun, is what Jesus is to the Father. The word emanates from the Father and brings light and life to us just as the sun brings life and light to us in a physical manner and the rays of the sun emanate from the sun itself, so Jesus is the emanating light and life of the Father to humanity. Isn't that crazy? So in Genesis 1, John wants you to see Jesus all over it. He's there, he's typified, he's shadowed, he's with the Father, he's effectualizing creation, and the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Another translation says, the darkness has not comprehended it, It hasn't understood it. So the light that shines in the darkness of men, which I'm going to highlight here, and go, this darkness is what humanity is in. We're in spiritual darkness. We're in separation from God. But Jesus comes as the light and the life that emanates from the Father as the Word, and he shines the light and the life of God into our very darkness. And guess what the darkness can't do? I highlight this in green just because I can. The darkness has not overcome it. Now, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, and all of a sudden the the introduction shifts a bit. And you're like, who's John? Is John the apostle? Well, no, John is writing about another man named John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. So you go, oh, that's how um, this man, John, fits into what he's already described in the first five verses, being the light in life. John the Baptist is who he's referring to, John here, which I'm going to highlight in blue. He's just a witness to tell everyone about the light that comes from the Father, that all might believe through him. Through who? Well, through John's testimony. John's just going, I want to be a reason that you believe in the Son and his life and light that emanates from the Father. Now, John the Baptist admits, you know, he was not the light. He says this pretty plain and clearly. But he came to bear witness about the light. In other words, God shines forth, sends forth his son as the light and life and word that comes from him, right? He sends forth his son, but not without a witness. God sends a witness ahead of this light to let people know the light is coming. The life of God himself embodied, personified light, he's coming to shine into our darkness. The true light, which gives light to everyone, By the way, not some, not most, everyone can benefit from the true light, 
he was coming into the world. Now, usually when John refers to the world, not always, but it can refer to the system that is overcome by darkness and ruled by the enemy currently, that which is up, opposed to God, the world system, which is itself darkness. So when you see in Genesis 1, light shines into the darkness, right? And God separates the light from the dark. God is going to do that through his son in a greater spiritual eternal fashion where the sun comes, shines his spiritual light into our dark world, and then darkness is separated from the light in terms of those who believe and trust in the light and are children of God from those who are children of the devil and just want to live in darkness and sin and don't believe. Now, he was in the world, Jesus, and the world was made through him. Just just in case you didn't catch it in verse 3, he wants you to know the whole world right here, which I'm going to highlight in blue again. Don't get freaked out. The world was made through this one who is the word, the life, and the light. Jesus. The world was made through him. Because remember, all things are made through him. Even the world that is currently in darkness. And you would expect the world to recognize and know its creator. But it's so dark. The world didn't actually know him. They didn't perceive who he was and recognize him. And John will go on to talk about the kind of people who don't know Jesus. This doesn't mean everyone in the world doesn't recognize or know Jesus. And the word know here in John 17, 3, Jesus will say, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Not everyone in the world doesn't know Jesus. A lot of people will recognize him. They go, you look and sound familiar. I know my Hebrew Bible. I follow God. Are you the Messiah, the one sent from God to bring salvation? He came to his own. Isn't it interesting that the same way darkness doesn't comprehend the light, we see some people in the world of darkness not comprehending or recognizing the Son who is light? That's a theme throughout John's Gospel. He came to his own, that being the nation of Israel. Who does Jesus come to first? He comes first to Israel as a nation. But you know what's really sad? His own people didn't receive him. And he told us in verse 10, it's because they didn't know him. So if they had known or recognized who he was, they would have received him. But they were in darkness. But there are people in the world, he says, who will receive him. To all who did receive Jesus, right? What does it mean to receive Jesus? Jesus. Well, it says to believe in his name, which refers to the substance and the, the character of, of the being in who's being described, Jesus, his name. He gave the right to become children of God. Now, now watch. We've talked about light, talked about life. We've talked about Jesus emanating from the Father. Now, what you see in Genesis chapter one is God makes man, humanity in his own image uniquely different from all other creatures and everything else he made. He makes humanity in his own image. We see something similar happening here in verse 12, where instead of physical creation and coming up from the ground and of the dirt and of the dust you come, we have Jesus giving people who believe in him and receive him. He gives them something called the right to be a child of God. It's as if Genesis chapter well, two technically where Adam and Eve are created. Genesis chapter two, if I remember correctly, where man comes from the dust, right? There's something similar happening here in a spiritual fashion where it's not people are being created of the earth and of the dust, but people are believing and receiving Jesus. And they're being given this right to be spiritually reborn and created as children of God in the likeness of Jesus himself. But who gives the right to become children of God? Well, that one who is the light and the life of God himself, the Son of God, the word that emanates from the Father, the living word gives the right to become a child of God. So one thing about this word is he gives people the ability, the right, the privilege, which means it's not an entitlement. People don't deserve this. But when Jesus when someone believes in Christ, right, his own right and status as the son of God, he gives that sonship 
to anyone who would believe. It's a right. It refers to, you know, it's inheritance language. This is your right. This is what you inherit. Jesus gives his own inheritance to his people, and part of that is becoming children of God. Now, notice the connection of becoming a child of God to having the life and the light that Jesus gives. And these becoming children of God, you know, I'll say like this. Uh, those who received and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who these children of God were born. You might say brought forth, not of blood. Okay. So not referring to their, not involving their physical descent from Abraham primarily. doesn't matter their heritage and lineage and what, you know, who they descend from, nor of the will of the flesh, meaning all of your, human ambition and desire and efforts and willpower doesn't that's not what produced this sonship nor of the will of man but of god so how are people made children of god how do you become a child of god well you have to be given the right to have that status in the family of god who does jesus give that to those who believe and receive him and trust in him how are you born of again do you, by your own you know, physical descent from someone, dictate that God makes you a child? No. Do you, by your own ability to obey the law and, 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 and do the right thing and, and be morally good, d- does, does that uh, force God's hand to make you his child? No. How about your will and your ambition? You want it so badly. You're going, God, I want this so bad. Make me a child by your own efforts. No. God graciously bestows upon you the right to be a child of God. He makes you his child. In other words, and I got to go here for a second, the Calvinist will say this born again experience is something that the will of man isn't capable of even desiring or pursuing. The will of man is opposed to this. So it's apart from your own desiring and willing. The willing here refers to the process by which you become a child of God. If God did not ordain sovereignly that faith granted us this sonship, It doesn't matter how hard you want it or desire it or work for it or who you descend from. You could never make that happen. But God has decided graciously that I'll give the right to become my child to those who receive my son and believe in his name. That's how powerful Jesus is. He's the means by which we saw all things exist and all things are made, including our spiritual standing with God or our new life in Christ. He brings forth that new created, you know, truest version of us, the spiritual sonship we're given. He brings that forth. It's like, well, Paul will talk about how we're, we're born again. Jesus will say this in John 3, you're born of the Spirit, you're born again. We're brought forth. And if God didn't decide he wanted to do that, no amount of willing or pursuing or desiring or ambition could make it happen. He's decided by his own gracious will that he'll make us children of God so that you can become sons of light and have the life of Christ, which is a relationship with the Father. Now, the word here became flesh and dwelt among us, which means the word Jesus preexisted his human life. You don't become something unless you already exist to become that. This would have said created or came into existence. No, the word became, took on a different form. He became one of us and he dwelt among us. And you know what John says? says, He says, we've seen his glory. The glory as of the only son from the father. Remember how I said, and I'm going to highlight this in green. Remember how I said Jesus is to the Father what the rays of the sun are to the sun itself. He emanates from the Father. He shines the light and the life of God. He comes from the Father, right? Just like the rays of the sun emanate from the sun itself. Well, the glory that the word of Jesus, Jesus himself, the glory that he reveals to humanity, that John says, I've seen it, that glory comes from the Father. Just like the life and the light and he being the word that proceeds from the Father. Now, the glory Jesus shows people. And John goes, 
we've seen his glory. You go, what glory? What radiance? What beauty and majesty? Well, it's the glory of the Son that comes from the Father. There's inherited glory. There's shared glory. John 17, Jesus will say in his high priestly, priestly prayer, right? From the Father, full of grace and truth. So the glory here being described actually involves these two things, grace and truth. So what has John specifically seen? Well, he's seen the word incarnate. He's seen the glory of the Son and the word. He's seen the grace of God embodied and the truth of God embodied. Jesus will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And John the Baptist bore witness about him and cried out this. Whew, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me. So far in John's gospel introduction, the ranking, the coming before, the pre-existing, all this language of Jesus is the one who is with the Father in eternity past. And John the Baptist even admits this. He was before me. Now, from his fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. There's two dimensions of grace being described here, right? There's one level of grace, and there's a second level of grace here. And from the fullness of Jesus, who is the truth, who is grace, who is the word made incarnate or become one of us, who is the light and the life, that Jesus actually gives us and has such overflowing grace from himself that he gives us grace that we've received. What is that grace specifically referring to? Well, it's up here. To become children of God. That's a gracious gift of God. So notice all these ideas colliding, which you see a lot of them in Genesis chapter 1. Life, light, the world coming into existence, God there, the word being spoken, right? Um, the light penetrating the darkness. Um, humanity being brought forth physically, but here it's spiritual rebirth, being born of the spirit, and it's a gift of grace. Now watch. I'm going to highlight this actually in blue, this Yeah, that's what I want to do. <laughs> For the law was given through Moses. So now we have the law and Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of people usually think grace and truth here are at odds with the law. And there are some ways in which the law is distinguished from grace and truth. But the law is still a gift of God to expose our inability and our problem. That's a gift. The knowledge of God in the law, that's a gift. The standard of God for the people of Israel, that's a gift. So this is still what's called grace. It's a grace that God allowed people to even know his ways and know where they fall short and know their problem and the law and all the things that accompany that. It's, a, it's still grace. But there's more grace we've received from the fullness of Jesus, which is the grace and truth that come in the, in the gospel, which is, hey, believe. And it's built on that first level of grace that comes through Moses. But that's not where it stops. In other words, Jesus here is the fullness of God's grace. And if you receive the grace he offers, you become something you could never become on your own and something the law could never grant you. No one has ever seen God. And you guys know, kind of random, isn't it? No one's ever seen God. What does that have to do with anything? Well, so far, John has made it abundantly clear through a bunch of different ways that if you've seen Jesus, you've actually seen the Father. And Jesus will actually say this to Thomas in John 14. You know, right here, the one who is with the Father, you might say uh, the visible presence of God, he's with God, who is the invisible presence, like we see in the Old Testament. Jesus who is the life and the light of God made manifest to people. He's the visible light and life of God. Um, or here, Jesus being made incarnate and the eternal word taking on flesh. We've seen the word of God, the life of God, the light of God, the one who is with God there at the beginning at the creation of the world. John's going, we've seen his glory. 
No one's ever seen God. The only God, though, which refers to Jesus, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. I'm just going to highlight this attribute. Jesus here is referred to as the only God, but he's alongside the Father. He's distinct from and alongside next to the Father. He's by the Father. And that Jesus, who is the Word, who is the embodiment of grace and truth and glory and and life and light and gives people the ability to become children of God, he's made him known. John wants you to know that Jesus is the perfect revelation of the Father. And if you want to know the Father, you ought to know the Son. And if you want the life and the light of God in your life, and if you want to be a child of God and belong in his family, you go through the Son, who is alongside the Father at creation. It's profound. And right here, in John's opening you know, introduction, you're going to see a lot of the main ideas that are going to be unpacked in depth throughout the rest of John's gospel. So I hope this was helpful in understanding how John 1 correlates to Genesis 1 and how it reveals Jesus to us properly and accurately. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you haven't already subscribed, go ahead and do that and hit the bell so you can be notified of any future videos that come out. And check out AboveReproachMinistry.com. We have completely free Bible study courses, a 40-day program, a 27-day and 11-day program, all kinds of free resources. You can get a copy of my book. You can join our online church. You can get some merch. We have a bunch of stuff at AboveReproachMinistry.com. And it's also linked in the description below. Go check that out. And thanks for watching.